Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to the Sustainably Grown Certification webinar. Uh, my name is Kevin Warner. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, my colleague, Alana Revord, who's the director of PR at SCS Global, will be sort of moderating this session. Um, we have all the attendees muted just because there could be feedback with microphones and all that. But if you have questions as we go through, please do enter them into the chat. Um, there's a chat box function that should be on the right side of your screen. Ask questions as we go. I, I like more kind of conversational presentations. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, we'll also have a more formal Q&A at the end if there are sort of large scale questions about the standard. Um, so my name is Kevin Warner. I'm the manager of sustainable agriculture at SCS Global. Um, I, in that role, I am the program manager for several in-house standards that we have created um, within the food and ag division um, focused on sustainability. Uh, sustainably grown is the largest one. And that's that's what we'll be talking about today. My background, I've got about 10 years in local food systems and sustainable agriculture across sectors. So I've, I've worked in for-profit, nonprofit, government. I, I was the agribusiness representative on the USDA's Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program for about three years. So I've done a lot of grant review and made funding decisions there. Um, we're going to show... Uh, well, I guess I'll add, I, I've been on this, in this role for nine or 10 months, and they've brought me on in a business development function. So we're doing, we're in the middle of a, the start of a PR campaign, and we just created a promotional video that we're, I'm going to show you real quickly, and then we'll dig into the standard. This is North Shore Living. Leo Overgog and his family have been growing herbs here in California's Coachella Valley for more than 20 years. My name's Leo Overgog. I'm with North Shore Greenhouses. And right now we have about 10 acres of greenhouses, 120 employees, and we strictly grow living herbs that we sell with the roots attached. The problem we have resolved by selling a living plant, you get much longer shelf life, and it just uh, pops out at you how fresh it is. North Shore's Living Herbs and Greens have been certified as sustainably grown by SCS Global Services and were the first product of its kind to be certified under the Eco-Label. Crops of all types and production systems are eligible to be certified. To achieve certification, agricultural products must meet rigorous standards for environmental protection, ethical production, social compliance, product quality, and food safety. It was the perfect fit for us to, to, to partner with SCS and, and get the certification. I saw that the company was going that direction because they have the sustainability part in their mind, not just to the environment, but also the social responsibility part. They like to take care of their employees. I'm really proud of how sustainable we are able to grow our products and the cool ways we're able to reduce our footprint. There's just different things that we're always looking at here to try and keep going a little bit farther. In the summertime, we have a huge need for cooling the greenhouses, which take a lot of power where we are located, we have 360 days of sun, so to invest in solar was the right thing to do for us. About two years we've had the solar system. It's producing about 50% of our, our power needs. The new greenhouses, we're recycling all the water and everything's grown on drip irrigation. We use about 70% less water than in field condition. All the air coming in is filtered and we keep the greenhouses super dry which helps with disease development, so there's no need for pesticide application. Each week, North Shore Living Herbs and Greens produces thousands of sustainably grown certified units bearing the SCS Kingfisher Eco Label. Certification from SCS provides transparency that retail customers and consumers trust. The retailers, they love our product because their shrink has been reduced. They get a lot of positive feedback from the customers that buy our product as well. Sustainably grown living herbs and greens from North Shore are leading the agricultural industry toward greater social and environmental responsibility. 
To learn more about sustainably grown certification for your products, visit our website at scsglobalservices.com. Okay. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to give you a background on SES Global. I will go into the key features of the sustainably grown standard, and then we'll do a bit of a deep dive into the framework, how the indicators work, and then after that, we'll look at what an audit process is, how we approach the audit, um, and then we'll do questions after that. So SES Global, a uh, bit of a company background. We were started in the mid 80s, about 35 years ago, uh, folk, based in California and San Francisco and focused on pesticide residue testing. And since then, we've diversified. So we, we work in sustainability across sectors and around the world. So we have employees globally and we have a auditor network that covers the whole world pretty much. Um, the underlying focus there though is stimulating environmental stewardship and social responsibility. We're really pushing sustainability across sectors. So today we're gonna to talk about food and ag, but we do, we work in built environment, in natural resources. We, we work in forestries and fisheries. We do a lot of work in carbon footprinting, life cycle analysis. Um, if sustainability is a part of it, we're, we're engaged. And that's, that's part of what makes SDS unique. Um, there are very few certifying bodies that work in all these different sectors. Just as a, you know, a sampling, we, we, we do a lot of third party certification within food safety and within sustainable agriculture. Um, but we've also created standards. We like the sustainably grown standard. We saw an opportunity and, and a gap in what certifications were doing and created a standard to fill that gap. We've also done extensive work with larger companies with complex supply chains, building internal frameworks for measuring and verifying sustainability. So we've done that with Ferrero, um, with their entire supply chain. With, with Starbucks, we've we created the Cafe Practices Program, which is their coffee supply chain um, responsible sourcing program. Um, and so we, for years now, we've been creating programs and creating standards and, and leveraging our experience in the industry as well as our sort of scientific credibility because we, we have a lot of, you know, scientists on staff and a lot of expertise in this area. So we're not, we audit to all these third party standards and we create these standards, but we also are audited ourselves. We have a robust quality system where we've got four or five people who work on it full time, um, making sure that we are doing everything we, we, we say we are and that we are in compliance with various standards. So the sustainably grown program is accredited by ANSI, which is the American National Standards Institution Institute. And they, they come in and audit us every year to make sure that um, we're, we're doing things right. So looking at the sustainably grown standard, let's, let's talk about some key features. The current version of the standard 2.1 was implemented in January of 2017. So we're pretty much a two years into the current version and it's, it was a, a pretty big upgrade from the previous version. So um, it's still a young program, but it's growing pretty rapidly. And that's been driven by the alignments we've had with different outside um, elements. So, so we are aligned, we were the first American standard aligned with the Global Social Compliance Program. Um, our framework is based off of the American National Standard for Sustainable Agriculture, and we we are in compliance with ISO 14024, which is for environmental labeling. And I'll 
I'll dig into this a little bit more. Um, some of what some of these mean. So, so for, for instance, the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative, the SI platform for farm sustainability assessment. That, this is um, a B two B standard. It's it's not really an eco label, but um, we've been benchmarked to it. And so, if when you get certified sustainably grown, you also have achieved um, FSA silver equivalents. Um, and I'll talk about some of these other uh, programs in more detail here. So the ANSI Leo 4000 is is basically the the standard for what sustainable agriculture is. This is a, a this was a seven year process that we were engaged with from the beginning, starting in the mid to late 2000s, and basically the the difficulty with sustainability especially with an agriculture right now is that it's an unsettled space. There's no government regulation defining sustainability in, in the way that, you know, there's a national organic program that defines what organic is there within sustainability, because it's not regulated, there's room for interpretation. Um, we, the, the Leo 4000 standard though, created, it's not regulatory, but it created a standard for, involving you know producers farmers government agencies academia ngos to come to a consensus consensus on what sustainable agriculture is supposed to be and the sustainably grown standard scs is based off of this framework like i mentioned earlier um sustainably grown was the first standard benchmark to the global social compliance program and this is a global standard that is focused on basically management practice, looking at, at how companies, and, and this is beyond agriculture, but how companies treat labor, um, whether their supply chains are clean, um, that sort of thing. And the reason this is important is it's the key to entry into Europe. So. As an example, Domanti is one of our larger customers under the standard, and we certify all of their pineapples that go into Europe. Um, they can't sell pineapple in Europe without being audited to a standard that is harmonized to the GSCP. And so a lot of the indicators, especially in the social compliance side of the standard are pulled from this GSCP standard. So another, another key feature of the sustainably grown standard is the conformance structure. So we have three types of indicators that um, you either meet or you don't, and, the, and they're required, general, and optional. And as you see here, you have to meet 100% of the required, 80% of the general, and 20% of the optional. And the required indicators, this, this is, these are the points that we see as completely necessary. You, you need to be doing these things to be considered sustainable within agriculture. Um, but then as you move up this these tiers, you have more flexibility. And I, th I think this is part of what makes the standard unique and applicable on a global scale. So the sustainability requirements for say a greenhouse in Southern California are very different than a hazelnut orchard in Turkey or a pineapple plantation in Costa Rica. Um, we want to meet people where they are, meet operations where they are, and help them um, reach sustainability goals. So by having this flexibility, it allows us to um, adapt to different geographies and different production systems. The optional indicators, if you if you look through the standard, tend to be focused more on continuous improvement. So looking at, are you reducing your water usage? Are you uh, reducing your energy usage or increasing your renewables? Um, that sort of thing. The, they're not, it's not hard to reach the optional, the 20% optional indicators, but most people do, but it, it, it sort of gives, um, an opportunity for for going above and beyond. So the 
this is not just a B2B standard. The, the, the global social compliance program harmonization allows it to be. Um, for some producers, they're not interested in the eco-label element. They're just trying to, they need to get into Europe and, and we're an effective way of getting into Europe. But um, if you go to the grocery store and buy a Del Monte pineapple, you'll see this label on the tag. Um, it's a, it is a useful marketing element. And about a year ago, we did a, a consumer survey of 1800 shoppers. And what we found consistently was that there was a willingness to pay a price premium for products labeled as sustainably grown. So you can basically certified customers can charge a little more because consumers see it as more valuable. Um, unlike most other certifications in the sustainability space and the social sustainability space, especially we don't um, have a licensing fee. So I don't know, like, like fair trade, if you certify fair trade, every box of bananas that you certify, you have to pay um, a percentage or a few cents um, which tends to add up really quickly. So we cover all of our costs through the certification process. There's no fee for use of the label, for use of the mark. Just a little bit of standard comparison. So um, sustainably grown is really robust. We have a lot of indicators and we cover the full scope of sustainability, the full production system. Um, we think it's better, but it, you know, it's, it's just, we have a different approach. Um, it's complementary to other programs though, too. So like the organic program is really good at a very, very narrow part of production, but it doesn't look at the social side. It doesn't really look at soil health, at greenhouse gases, at water quality or water usage. Um, there's a lot of production agriculture that just doesn't get covered within an organic program. So we feel that we're pretty useful as a complement there to, to cover the social compliance side of things as well as broader environmental elements. So let's, let's dig into the structure a little bit and um, kind of do a little bit of a deep dive here. So the sustainably grown certification has 372 indicators uh, that are broken up into four sections. So in this example, you know, um, there's an environmental section, which is section four. There's a group of indicators within it, a criteria of on soil erosion. And so those are the 4.2.1. Within that, there's each indicator, so 4.2.1.1. Um, the four sections are general, social, environmental, and economic. The the three there's there's within sustainable agriculture, within sustainability more broadly, there are three pillars to sustainability: so social, environmental, economic. Um, sometimes it's, it's looked at as the three legs of a stool. Um, and it's, it's people, planet, and profits. We've added uh, this general area partially because of the GSCP, the Global Social Compliance Program. Um, it's, you know, looking at the management system. Are you in compliance with international labor standards um, that don't necessarily fit within those three pillars of sustainability? Um, so I'm, I'm going to jump into each of these just just briefly um oh but before i do we can look at this the indicator classifications a little bit more closely i, I, I covered this pretty well earlier but again the required general optional are there for for not just flexibility but but allowing the standard to adapt to different geographies and different production systems. Um, as you see on the, the far right of the screen, there, there's 
23 general indicators, 125 environmental, 192 social, and 32 economic. Looking at those a little bit more, um, general requirements are, this is just your, your management system, your administrative requirements. Are you in compliance with international laws, with local laws? Um, what are you doing in terms of traceability and chain of custody? Basically, you would you know, is your do you have a strong management system in place to to be above board, to be legal? The environmental elements are this is the second biggest section, and it's these are really drawn from that Leo four thousand you know standards for environmental standards for sustainable agriculture. Um, this is broad based. This is looking at soil. It's looking at water. It's looking at greenhouse gases, energy efficiency. And, and waste management is the biggest one. There's, um, we really want to see that you're making efforts to uh, recover value from your waste stream. So you're not just dumping the, those nutrients, you're reincorporating that into your production systems. Social requirements. So 192 indicators is the largest section. And I think this is probably the one that has the most value for our customers. Um, it's, it, you know, it looks at major issues like child labor, forced labor, you know, modern slavery, but it's really looking at, at the quality of life for your workers and your community. Um, do you, are you providing a safe environment? Is it, is it livable? Is it, is it, good for everyone involved. Um, the reason I say this is the most value for our clients is these, these social compliance elements are what retailers are really looking at right now. This is where, this is the direction sustainable ag is going. Um, the environmental stuff is important. I think there's, there's more and more consumer demand for it, but on the social side, um, retailers don't want skeletons in the closet they don't want forced labor in their supply chain and they they want third party auditing and certification to to ensure that that's not happening especially in a globalized world where food moves around a lot farther there's a lot more points in the supply chain than there maybe would have been 50 years ago um one last thing is we we do look at our chemical handling um, as, a, as a part of worker health and safety. Um, we understand that there are chemicals involved in agriculture and we don't necessarily have a problem with that, but we want it to be them to be used in a safe way for, for those involved. So economic requirements. Um, this is the smallest section, but a lot of these, there's a lot of overlap. So you know, we look at wages for workers in the social side, but th that can be put into economic as well. Um, the biggest thing here is resilience, I would say. It, we, we're we looking for a management system and an operation that is based around longevity. I read a, a definition of sustainable agriculture a couple of years ago that defined it as the production of abundant food and fiber without limiting the ability of future generations to do the same. So we're looking at, are you, do you have an operation that will stand the test of time? Well, are you, are you set up to, for the long run, as opposed to, um, you know, using up your resources and then moving on? So that's it on the um, the details of the standard. Let's look at the audit process a little bit and I'll walk you through how the audit works and what that looks like. So the sustainably grown standard is on a an annual certification cycle. So the first year we do a certification audit and in this slide, this kind of gives you a roadmap where the blue parts are offsite and the green parts are the on-site audit. So 
we start with audit planning, we do the audit, then there's reporting and corrective action process, and then a certification decision is issued. And I'll dig into each of these steps here. So pre-audit, before, before we come out to you, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's, first you have to apply, we give you, a, uh, we scope the project, we give you a price quote, you authorize it, um, you put 50% down of the work order, and then we work on audit scheduling. Um, this can be a quick process or it can take months. It really depends on um, harvests generally. So we need to be there when you're at the peak of your harvest season because we wanna be there when the, the majority of your workers are there. Um, if you, you know, like a greenhouse, if you're producing all the time, we can kind of come anytime. But if you're growing onions, um, that there's a very specific window that we want to be on site. Um, so once it's scheduled, we, there's a whole uh, element of audit preparation where you get your records in order, get your your house in order, basically. Um, the more work you do at this point, the easier the audit is and the less time the audit takes. Um, we do have a pre-assessment audit, so we can send someone out and do a pre-audit. This is generally for those bigger multinational companies that are kind of having a top-down approach to sustainability where they, they want it, but maybe their supply chain, their production is not quite there yet. And so this helps those operations that aren't really focused on sustainability, sustainability get their operations in line for small and medium operations that are already working on sustainability, the pre-assessment is less useful and less necessary, I would say. So going through this process, we, we give you a lot of documents. We give you the standard, um, we give you the prohibited pesticide list. There's a certification manual. There's, there's a lot of documents we, we give you so that you can be as prepared as possible for the audit. Um, we also, you know, go under contract with you and we, we have a professional services agreement. So everything that happens within this certification process is confidential. Um, we won't talk about it and we, we hope that you won't either if, if unless there's something you want to brag about. So once you're certified, you know, my job is to talk you up. That's why we we're working on this PR campaign. We, we, you know, have did this North Shore video a few weeks ago. Um, once you're certified, I want to promote that fact and, and help that help you in growing the business and help and pushing the label on consumers. But the operational side of auditing is, is totally confidential. So we create an, uh, a unique audit plan for each operation. Um, and this is a tool for the auditor to know what they have, they're, they're getting themselves into, what, what, the, what to expect when they come on farm. Um, and this is the scope, who, who the contacts are, um, and basically just the logistics of, of how the audit is gonna play out. Um, it's really critical uh, during that audit planning phase that we have a as, as accurate of information as possible because we need to determine how much time it's going to take to see the, the fields and talk to the workers and review records. Um, and I'll, I will talk about scope here in a second. So what's included in the scope of a sustainable grown audit? Um, all labor from contractors um, all the way up to management. We, we want to talk to people across the operation. Um, we also, we look at housing, we look at multiple production sites uh, and even different legal entities. If you've got a packing house on site that's part of the production, um, that counts, even if it's, you know, 
technically owned or it's a separate legal entity. Um, if it's part of that primary production, it's within the scope of the sustainably grown audit. Um, just a little more detail on this. You know, we, we, we want to customize the audit to your operations so that we can really focus on the areas of risk. Um, every food or commodity has different risk points um, from a environmental side, from a, a social side. And we really, you know, if, if we have a three day audit or a four day audit, we really need to make good use of that time to make sure that we are seeking out those points of risk to make that make sure everything's in order. So um, this is driven by the standard, but we, we, we want to apply the standard to the specific operation. Um, so the better you can provide the, the, the better information you can provide us with during this pre audit period, the smoother the audit will go. So the actual audit, what happens? Um, there's an opening meeting where the auditor meets with management, whoever's um, with them through the audit at the operation. Um, and then the audit is, consists of document and record review, direct observation of fields, orchards, facilities, and then worker interviews, which are a major component. And then we have a closing meeting. Um, the opening meeting is just confirming schedule, making sure that we everything is going to work as as planned in the pre audit agenda, and really narrowing down on a plan of attack on how we're going to approach um, seeing sites, talking to workers, doing document review. Um, I guess also I'll add, you know, there, there's there's a lot we can't do beforehand. We can't look at pay stubs, look at a lot of the information you don't want to share online. Um, it, it really requires the auditor to be on site and assessing things. Um, so three big elements of the sustainably grown um, program or, or audit. Direct observation. We want to see facilities. We want to see fields. We're going to walk around. We're going to drive around. We're going to interview workers. Um, I'll go into that on another slide, but we, we, a big part of the, what makes this program unique is the in-depth interviews. Um, we find that it's a really strong way of determining whether the documents review and the records review are accurate. Um, it's, it's, it's how we determine whether what your paperwork is saying is actually what's happening in the fields. Um, interviews can take up to 15 minutes per person. So it, for operations that are more mechanized, say like, I don't know, potato operation where it's two guys in a tractor doing most of the work, um, the audit is much quicker. If, if you're you know, a pineapple plantation in Kenya with 5,000 employees, it can take a long time. Um, those are both real examples too. We, we, uh, the, the, what you're growing and how you grow, it really affects the interview, uh, stage in terms of time commitment and that, it affects costs and, and all that. So what are we looking for in meeting indicators. We were looking for factional, factual, relevant, and significant information. Um, our, our auditors are very highly trained. They, they are very experienced and they, they, they're very good in that they can pick up on nuance. Um, some things like, I don't know, an indicator that says 100% of energy is coming from renewable sources. That's an easy, binary yes no so other under indicators really take uh a bit of interpretation and our auditors are trained to look for that but in any case it needs to be factual relevant and significant so i've touched on this a little bit but you know guidelines for for areas where we want to go to we, we always want to go to the central office administrative area um 
we want to look at all facilities and infrastructure like housing break rooms um, mechanical shops chemical storage and then we observe a representative number of fields so we look at this as at an acreage um or we approach this from an acreage standpoint and we're, we're the reason we we do it this way is we're looking for risk um you know the the facilities where workers are is where there's most risk within the social compliance side of things so an empty field presents less risk um, during an active audit so to determine how much we we see we, we do the square root of the total number of fields and then multiply that by 1.5 um, and that from year to year we try and see different fields different areas so it's a three-year audit cycle and and we do our best to see everything within that three-year time but in any given year we, we understand that it's sometimes not practical to see everything um, which is why we focus on risks um, again uh, from an environmental standpoint we're looking at you know risks of erosion conservation areas waterways what what are the broader impacts you're having and those are those are points of environmental risk that we we do focus on so keys to successful site tours um like i said we want to field visit fields and facilities while they're actually being used um we want to start see the end and or the start and the end of each work shift and we're looking for communication to employees of, of what the policies are it's not enough to just have you know a bunch of standards of practice in a notebook in the office um, employees need to understand not just their rights but how things are supposed to be how how they should be, be behaving from a safety standpoint um, we look at safe handling of agrochemicals this is an important one um, and one where there, we do see issues pretty regularly. Um, and then during this whole process, we're doing discrete interviews with supervisors, with workers, with, you know, all of the labor force. Um, and we want them to be informal, but um, authentic, I would say. So the worker interviews, um, like the acreage element we we do we generally t approach interviews as, as we want to talk to the square root of the total number of employees for some of those larger operations like i mentioned the 5,000 workers on a pineapple plantation in kenya we might bump up that number a little bit because as you get a larger number the the square root is smaller relative to the total workforce so we you know we, we can we have the flexibility to bump that up but Generally speaking, we want to have a representative sample. We want to talk to um, people at the top and at the bottom. We want to talk to uh, people of different ages, different genders, um, long-term workers and, and recent hires um, to get a, a real sense of what your operation is and how, it, how it's working. So for each indicator within the standard, um, you can either be in conformance or non-conformance. Um, it, it is kind of a binary thing, but we have two other levels that are maybe are, are worth explaining a little bit more. So recommendation, this is for optional level indicators. So this is the 20% the that you have to meet. This is where recommendation for the future, it would, it would take, you know, not much, it wouldn't take much work to meet this this is something you could work on in the future and then opportunities for improvement this is where we see things that there, it's not a non-conformity but the, it, it could be improved and, and then we want to see you work on this for next year um, with all of this you know there, there's obviously a certificate certification decision each year but we're looking at sustainability as a process as uh, a continuous improvement ongoing thing where we're we're helping you improve your operation over time so the 
opportunities for improvement are just a it's a mechanism and a tool for that. Um, and in subsequent years, auditors will look at previous reports and, and see what are the what were the OFIs last year. Uh, what has the operation done to work on those issues? Within you know conformity or non-conformity, especially non-conformity, there, there are classifications of findings. So critical, major, and minor. Um, this is all defined in the certification manual. So if you're going through this process, you've got all this information. But just to touch on it, um, you know, a critical finding, and, and we don't tend to find critical findings. They're, they're, but this is this is child labor. This is slave labor. Um, the sorts of things that would stop the audit it would would you know require uh it would basically be, we, we can't move forward at this point um major and minor are more about frequency um whether this is it's a systemic issue or an isolated occurrence um and it's it's more reflective of how much work you're gonna have to do to fix it um depending on how severe it is all, again, like all of this is in is provided in the certification manual. So if you're if you have questions, we can we can look at that um, maybe offline. So once you've gone through the audit, um, we have our closing meeting, and and we try to be very transparent here, where the auditor will tell you what they found, where where they saw issues. Um, we try to get you the audit report within 20 days, 20 business days. Um, and then we go through what we call a corrective action process where you have these nonconformities and then this is an opportunity for you to correct them to get, correct your, what, whatever's wrong, um, to get your operation in line with the standard. Um, so you, you correct the process, you document, you, you provide evidence for implementation of the change, um, and then submit that. And then this can go back and forth um, up to five rounds. It doesn't usually get that far, but th the difficult thing here is we can't tell you what we need, what you need to change because that falls into consulting. Um, and as the auditing body, we can't tell you, you need to do this to meet the indicator. So that's where sometimes it can, can take a few rounds to get it all cleared up. Um, we have recently trained an outside consultant on the standard who is helping producers get through the process. And that really helps because they can actually tell you what you need to do to be in line with the standard. Um, so once the so the corrective action process should be about 60 days. Um, some NCs can't be fixed because they were one-off issues at say like the time of harvest. And if you're past harvest, you can't fix it, but you can create a plan for the next year. And, and we, we might close NCs contingent on it not being an issue the next year. Um, but that tends to be for those minor um, issues. So then we have a certification decision once that corrective action process is completed. Um, it's a three-year cycle. The first year is the evaluation audit followed by surveillance audits in the second and third year. Um, again, there's no licensing fees with this or required price premiums um, or restructuring of labor the way a lot of the other social audits require. Um, that have those elements of, I don't want to say unionization, but you know, require um, restructuring your labor and having regular meetings. And, and there's a lot of costs entailed there. Um, we don't require that. And part of the reason for that is that we have this robust interview process that we think catches a lot of, um, a lot of issues and, and, and is able to focus on those points of risk, like I mentioned, um, and doesn't require the creation of some sort of worker representation structure. Um, one last thing here too, that 
the certification decision has made someone outside of the employees of SES who are working on the evaluation process. So we'll we'll pass all the documents over to someone in a different department who makes that final decision. So that there's um, they're not influenced by whatever uh, during during this process. So just to, to close, a few benefits of sustainable sustainably grown and and where we see um, current clients getting the most value. And a big one is mapping risk and supply chains. Um, if you're a producer, you might be at the bottom of the supply chain, but buyers are more and more aware of this. And, and some of this is a PR thing where retailers don't want to have PR risk in their supply chains. They they want these certifications. Um, they want sustainably grown or, or certifications in, in this genre um, as a way of removing that risk, um, both to their reputation and to their supply. Another thing is because, like I mentioned, SCS does so many different certification standards, um, we're able to combine audits and this reduces audit fatigue. Um, it's a real issue as I'm sure you all know, you know, the, an audit takes up time um, and that's really valuable, especially at peak season. So by being able to combine sustainably grown with global gap, um, we can make the audit process easier for you without, w w while still adding the value of, you know, a social and environmental sustainability audit. Um, a lot of the indicators that are looking at operational improvements actually improve the efficacy of production operations. So meeting those those indicators and meeting the standard will basically smooth out your operation. Um, I'm not going to go through these last couple ones, but I'll. Uh, I think we're going to move to questions now. Um, Thanks, Kevin. Uh, this is Alana, your moderator. We do have uh, one question at this time. If anyone else would like to ask a question, feel free to type it in the question box. Um, or I believe you may also be able to raise your hand and I can unmute your line. We'll start with this initial question, which is going back to the topic of retailers wanting more social compliance. Our questioner asks, are there any studies um, that have been done or surveys of retailers that uh, demonstrate uh, uh, this trend and or other evidence that you have uh, for that and also if you have any information about what other certification schemes might be doing to include more social compliance uh, in their standards sure sure um, well so for, from the retailer standpoint it's required in Europe at this point and I would say Europe's probably five to 10 years ahead of us right now in terms of that, but it's the direction that everyone's going. Within the US, um, there's not been harmonization. I, I think sustainability is where food safety was 20 years ago. Um, it's an unsettled space. And so a lot of retailers are just working on internal elements right now until there is harmonization across the U.S. sector. Um, that being said, you know I, I'm, I, I deal with these retailers pretty frequently. I, I was in a call with the sustainability team at Walmart maybe a month ago, and they're not at a point of endorsing anyone, but they are looking at all this really carefully and are expecting it more and more. Um, also a lot of the, the big food companies that have global presence are requiring it. So like a Starbucks is, is, um, re is requires some sort of social audits. Um, global gap is sort of a, you know, global gap, especially with the grasp add on um, is sort of a low barrier entry to sustainability, but it, it's, it's definitely more of a food safety audit. Um, Additionally, there's 
there's movement in in North America on this. So PMA, the Produce Marketing Association, and United Fresh have created an ethical charter with industry that is not unlike the global social compliance program, but at this time, it doesn't have teeth. There's no requirement for certifying against it. It's more just internal. Um, but, uh, you know, like Costco is requiring is requiring it more and more. Like you look at, that's why EFI exists, the Equitable, Equitable Food Initiative, um, which SCS also audits to pretty extensively. Um, I think we were, maybe we were the first certifying body on it. EFI, and, and, and they accept sustainably grown as well. Um, they are looking at that more and more, especially for those um, tropical commodities, the bananas, the coffees, those sorts of things. Um, I think what's unique about sustainably grown is that it fits both that smallholder cooperative um, model, but also the more North American, you know, single owner type of production systems. Um, Thanks, sorry, Kevin. I do. Yes, I do second. have more questions coming in. There, there was a second half to that, that question, though. I, that was retailers and then... And um, other certifications uh, working to include more social compliance, if you have yeah, a brief yeah. answer on that. So, so like Global Gap has now has this grasp add-on, um, which is a really good first step. I would say the grasp add-on is, is a social compliance element, but it's only like 10 indicators. It's not in depth. Um, Primus has added, has, has an add-on now for sustainability, but it's it's purely environmental. It doesn't look at workers at all. It doesn't look at uh, treatment of labor. And so I think it's somewhat limited because of that. Um, organic, you know, there's this regenerative organic association or, or, or uh, ROC, I think it's, there's so many acronyms, like they kind of run together in my head, but, you know, there's a movement there to add the social compliance onto certified organic. It's pretty limited because the social compliance standards they're using are, are really geared towards that cooperative model. So it, it's, it is the fair trades of the world. So it's, it's, um, you know, it, it, they're, they're working that way, but there's, it's not there yet. Uh, other questions, Alana? Yes, thank you. I have two about organic, actually. Um, the first one is if the operation is certified, or certified as organic, does that assist with sections of the audit or make certain sections more attainable? And the second organic question is, would you say that sustainably grown certification favors organic programs more than conventional programs? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, I would say because the scope of organic is so narrow, there's a little bit of overlap and, you know, there, it's, it's likely that the operation is from a management system is more lined up with the requirements of sustainably grown, but the breadth of indicators that are covered by our standard are pretty significant um, compared to certified organic. I, I wouldn't say it's harder necessarily. It's just, it, it goes in a lot of different directions across the whole production system. Um, in terms of favoring organic operations, I I don't think so. Um, I, I, you know, I, I feel like organic is what, like 7% of food on the shelves and 1% and of the land in the United States is, is certified. Um, we really, I would say we like organic. We think it fits well as a complementary standard to sustainably grown, but we we're also looking at, you know, the other 93% of food. How do we shift those practices towards sustainability? Um, the, you got to figure the top third of conventional pro production has a lot going on that they should get maybe commended for. Um, I'm, I'm based in the Midwest in St. Louis and there's things here that just can't be grown organically that 
can be grown on the West Coast organically a whole lot easier. Um, and I think within the consumer side of of the industry, there's been sort of this false binary of organic is good and conventional is bad. And I think everyone in, in the industry knows that's just not true. There, there are awesome organic operators, but there's also ones that are maybe kind of questionable. If you look at, I don't know, some of the dairy operations in Colorado or in Texas. Um, and again, there's, there's conventional operations that are really, really good, but they're in an area where organic's just not possible, um, especially if you're looking at, I don't know, fruit production in a, in a humid area. Um, so we don't, I would say we don't favor one over the other. I think there's room at the table for everyone. Thanks, Kevin. We have an additional question about B Corp certification. Uh, does this certification, the Sustainably Grown certification, uh, complement or compete with B Corp certification? Well, that's interesting. Um, I would say complement. You know what? B Corp isn't specific to food. So I, I think there's there's a lot of compliments in terms of like the labor side of things, the social side of things. Um, they definitely align. Um, but B Corp is more about social mission of the enterprise. Um, my, my, so my, my mentor at, at my MBA program started the B Corp movement in the UK. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, SES is actually was a is a chartered benefit corporation. We were a B Corp certified for a few years, but aren't currently certified. But we 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 are a B benefit corporation under California statute. So I, I, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think they're just different beasts. I think if you are currently a B Corp, you're going to have a whole lot easier time meeting a lot of the social criteria within this standard. Um, so there's definitely alignment there, but it's different messaging from a consumer facing side. Thanks, Kevin. I believe that's all the questions I have at this time. If anyone else would like to ask a question as we um, wrap, um, we'll be happy to ask those. Um, it looks like I've got a question of clarification. Um, can you clarify if a producer meets sustainably grown standard, would they also um, meet the four other standards mentioned. Um, I don't, which standards? I, I'm not sure that I follow that. Like organic and B Corp and. I'm not receiving any additional details. May I suggest that I connect you with that questioner directly, Kevin? And, oh, uh, you know what it might be? The GSCP and the FSA. Um, yeah, so for those those benchmarks that we are harmonized with, um, if you are certified under Sustainably Grown, you're compliant with all of those other standards, um, which are generally not consumer-facing standards, but more B2B standards that open up markets for products. So that, I think that probably answers it. Um, well, thank you everyone. I really appreciate your time. If you have further questions, I'm always happy to, you know, have a call or shoot me an email. Um, and uh, happy to talk about certifications or sustainability in general. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. Have a good day.